I now give the floor to the representative of Pakistan. Ambassador, the floor is yours. I thank you. <clears throat> Mr. President, we are grateful to the Vietnamese uh, presidency for convening this timely debate on international peace and security. Mr. President, the world order established 75 years ago on the basis of the fundamental principles of the UN Charter is rapidly eroding today. Pakistan has a vital stake in the preservation and promotion of this order and the building of a structure of world peace and cooperation built on the foundations of the UN Charter. Pakistan hopes, Mr. President, that in Afghanistan, the U.S. Taliban talks, which we have facilitated, will soon result in an agreement <clears throat> that enables the withdrawal of foreign forces, a cessation of violence, a comprehensive intra-Afghan dialogue, and the elimination of terrorism from Afghanistan. Mr. President, Prime Minister Imran Khan <clears throat> has also deployed personal efforts to reduce the tensions in the Gulf region. Pakistan will not become party to any regional conflict. We will always be a partner for peace. Mr. President, recent events have amplified the multiple and complex threats to peace and security in the Middle East. Denial of self-determination to the Palestinian people and disruption of the sovereignty and stability of Iraq, Syria, and Yemen. Mr. President, it is now over 150 days that eight million people in the Kashmir Valley have been kept under a cruel curfew and a communications blackout by an Indian occupation force of 900,000 troops. All Kashmiri leaders remain in jails across India. Thousands of young boys have been abducted arbitrarily detained, tortured, and maimed. Women subjected to sexual harassment, humiliation, and intimidation, and all protest violently suppressed. My delegation has circulated a dossier of reports filed by independent journalists and observers which vividly illustrate the climate of fear and the reign of terror that India has imposed on the Kashmiri people. The signals from India of aggressive intent towards Pakistan are also unmistakable. Mr. President, India has issued new political maps which lay claim not only to Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir but also Pakistan administered Azad Kashmir and Gilgit Baltistan. India's foreign minister has boasted <clears throat> that they will one day take physical control of this territory as well. India has committed over 3,000 ceasefire violations along the line of control last year. It has now cut the fencing along the LOC in five places and deployed spike Israeli anti-tank and BrahMos cruise missiles along the LOC. The incoming Indian Army chief has claimed the right to a preemptive attack against Pakistan. India could stage another false flag terror incident to create a casus belli for such an attack. 
India's military doctrine envisages fighting a, I quote, limited war with Pakistan under the nuclear overhang. It has built a capacity for the so-called cold start, which is surprise strike across the Indian-Pakistan border. And on 18th August last year, the Indian Defense Minister held out a thinly disguised threat of a preemptive nuclear strike against Pakistan. Mr. President, Pakistan does not want war with India. But as we demonstrated last February, if attacked, Pakistan will respond resolutely and effectively. The February aerial exchanges were contained due to Prime Minister Imran Khan's gesture to unilaterally return the Indian pilot we captured after shooting down two Indian fighter aircraft. We may not be so fortunate next time. Mr. President, Pakistan requests the Security Council and we request the Secretary General to act decisively to prevent a disastrous war between Pakistan and India, to call for an end to the grave human rights violations in occupied Jammu and Kashmir, and to enable the Kashmiri people to exercise their right of self-determination, a right which was promised to them in the resolutions of this council. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the representative of Pakistan for his statement.